lifted up and tremble again. And so some of this morning will highlight some of that. But let me give you some announcements first, and we'll transition that briefly. Speaking of tremble, today at 1 o'clock, if you want to know how you can help up there, they're having a work day. It's a potluck work day. So show up and eat, and then there's always projects to do up there. So if you don't know where Tremble is, go north on 169 for about six miles, and the Baptist Church is about a, a, now a block or two behind the gas station there. So apparently smell for the potluck, and you'll end up there. But it'd be a good way for you to get involved and even see what we're doing up there. You're going to meet Joel and Amanda here in a second. And uh, anyway, today at 1 o'clock in Tremble is a work day. Uh, El Salvador, listen, this is a precise announcement. You got to get these details down. The trip is still on. So if somebody says, is there still a trip to El Salvador? The answer is yes, there is. But we have a phrase in El Salvador called until things change, UTC. Well, things have changed and the fundraising or the information banquet is not happening. Okay, follow me on this. The dinner's canceled, the trip is not. Okay, because there's details that were going to be shared at the dinner. Those details are changing, and so they can't give the dinner and give the details. So the trip's still on, but that dinner that was scheduled is no longer on. So I don't know if you've signed up or thought about it, but forget the dinner part, but yes, still the trip is on. Thirdly, uh, Grace 201 is coming up. This is a great chance to figure out where you might fit into ministry. I'm actually going to talk about that in the message here in a bit, that there, we need people all the time that find their role in ministry. And Grace 201 is a great way to do that. You can sign up in the lobby or online to do that. Easter's coming up. I think you know that. There's lots of things. We're having three services this year. We weren't sure how to do this, so we're going to have an 8 a.m. service, a 9 a.m. service, and an 11 a.m. service. No Sunday school that day. So 8, 9, and 11. So if you're normally at 9 or 11, those times don't change, but we're throwing an 8 a.m. in the meantime. There are signs in the lobby. Pick one of those up and put them in your yard. I always like seeing those pop up and see where people live sometimes. And so I've seen a few around. I think, I didn't know a grace person lived there. But pick up a sign, plan on being here, invite some friends uh, to Easter with you as well. Along the lines of Easter, on Good Friday, we're going to have what we call a reflective Good Friday service. We'll, uh, we'll observe the Lord's Supper that night. It's not an egg hunt. It's not a... It's not a party in that sense. It's really reflecting on what happened on the night that Christ was crucified and, and so we're going to, or the day that he was crucified. And so it's going to be a reflective service at 7 p.m. on Good Friday. So that's uh, what, April, yeah, you got it, April 7th, uh, that night at 7 p.m. And then we are highlighting this month the North American Missions Offering. And um, you've heard from Angie Sanders. I think you've heard from Kelly Perkins. And today you're going to hear from uh, Joel and Amanda Montonia. And here's the transition a little bit. Not only are they uh, leading the charge up there in Trimble, but they are beneficiaries of the North American Missions Offering. The, uh, we call it NAM around here, NAMB, North American Mission Board. And they have just been through an assessment process that uh, NAM does with a lot of church planters. And so they were in, Can in Shawnee Mission. Um, I was there with them. A couple, couple weeks ago now, and with 23 others or 22 other couples or people, um, there's several church plants going on. We don't see it all the time. We're, we're focused on this one, but there, there are people from all over the country being trained and assessed to plant churches, and uh, they're, they're given tools to do that and resources to do that. So I just want to ask them a couple questions so you can kind of know what's going on. Again, Joel's going to be the pastor up there in Trimble. And Amanda, as you know, goes along with the pastor and is a great uh, part of that process as well. So the first question I have, and I don't know who has the mic, I guess you do, Amanda. Um, how were you encouraged with that assessment process? What, what encouragement did you find because of that? Just seeing that we are not the only ones that are doing, you know, missions here in the Midwest, like in our little neck of the woods. There's people from Kearney, from um, up in Iowa. It's just encouraging to be around others that are doing the same thing. Yeah. Uh, planting a church and starting plant a church can be very isolating sometimes. And it's good to know you're not alone in that. So I appreciate that. Um, I know you've talked. There's a guy named Adam Stoddard you've talked to. There's some resources available beyond um, not just salary comes along with this, but also some other resources. Just what did you talk about Adam about or talk to him about? Well, uh, in talking with Adam, uh, I mentioned that Trimble will be the only gospel presence uh, in Trimble, the, the church up there. Um, and so 
trying to pair with the community and because the city park up there is just, it's an old rusty swing set. Um, I mean, I know that's what some of us grew up on, but <laughs> you know, uh, so just talking with him to see if we could pair with the city to actually put a playground on the property of the church and, and that there's additional resources for that and um, um, just any additional resources just that we need, just reach out to him uh, and, and he can make it happen. Yeah, so that's, all this is to tell you, when you give, not just generally to our church, because we pass some of that on, but specifically the North American Missions Offering, it goes exactly to stuff like that. It goes to help summer missionaries, it goes to help church planters, and even resources there. So we encourage you to give, and we just wanted to put a face on that and tell you why. Uh, a little uh, fun part about this, part of what we do with Joel is we train him and get him ready for go, to go at 11 o'clock today. All right, you ready for this? Are you ready for this? At 11 o'clock today, I'm not preaching, Joel's preaching right here for the Tremble people and anybody who wants to stay. So even if you're here at 9, I would encourage you to stick around for 11 and kind of support what's going on up there just by giving him that run through. It'll be the same passage I preach, so it may be totally different or you might be bored with it by noon, I don't know. Uh, but I encourage you to do that. So I want to do something first. I want to pray for these guys, and then I'm going to ask Amanda to read scripture. But let's pray, okay? God, thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning. Um, thank you, God, for the way you've just brought your people together in so many different backgrounds, in so many different ways, for moments like this, where we can see your hand at work, and we can see the generosity of your people uh, support your work in a community that, as Joel said, will have only one gospel-based church there. And so we just pray, God, for the work already, that the, the fields would be ripe for harvest, and that you would send out the workers, and your son would be glorified. So God, bless these efforts, bless this couple, God, and their family, and uh, God, we just look forward to seeing what you're going to do there. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, would you stand as Amanda reads? Psalm 63, 1 through 5. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. All right, let's see those singing lips, all right? Lift us up always like 
morning. Good morning. I just want to give a shout out to the team here. I was gone last week, and you probably never even noticed it. They did an awesome job. I watched it online, but um, I was down in Mexico, Missouri. I was in Mexico. I just got back. No, I was in Mexico, Missouri at uh, the Union Baptist Church down there, and uh, I spoke at a wild game supper on Saturday night, and then uh, they invited me to lead worship for them the next morning, and uh, actually preach. So I, I got to preach my first sermon last week. And George, it's really hard. I don't know if you're still in here. It was pretty funny because I was on, I was going along and I heard I, their pastor told me something that you ne worship leaders never hear. He goes, hey, can you do another song? I never hear that. guy. Hey, we're, we got stuff going on. Can you cut a song is usually what I hear. So he, we threw another song in there that made me run, run, run a little long on my, on my sermon. And I said, I was going along, and I looked at the clock, and I went, oh, I need to get going here. I, I tend to ramble a little bit. And a lady in, in the front says, uh, you sure do. <laughs> I'm like, all right. But anyway, I'm so grateful that you guys are here this morning with me. Alone in my sorrow in dead in my sin lost without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed only beauty remains my orphan heart given a name my glory grew quiet my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace so
There's a lot going on in there. Easter's coming. Dee Dee just got back. You weren't in Mexico, were you? Mm. No. Dallas. She was in Texas. <laughs> she just got back at what, seven? Yeah, something like We got up at three, so I don't know. I don't know where I am or what time <laughs> Yeah, it is. she just got here from the airport. Somebody, Leroy dropped her off, and <laughs> there she is. Thank you for being here. Glad you're home. I washed the dishes too, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> Anyway, we, uh, we're, we're going to introduce a new song to you, at least new for us. It's not a new song, but uh, so uh, I think Kara was on spring break, so she just showed up this morning too, so we'll see how it goes. That's, uh, I'm just apologizing ahead of time is what I'm saying. Let's go. This is a great song, though.
in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my death. Father, there's so much truth in that song. Thank you so much for your, the love and the mercy that you give us. Uh, Lord, we are um, ever grateful. Our faith is in you alone. Um, and when we try to put it in anything else in our own strength, we fail and we fall sh so short. So God, help us to remember the promises of your word, the goodness of your grace and your mercy may be new for us every morning. I am so grateful for that. Because we are we are messed up, and we just need uh, we need your love. We need uh, we need the the covering that we get from the blood of Jesus, and we just uh, sing about that and praise you this morning. Now, as we open your word, may you be uh, just part of the part of what's going on here in in, in helping us to see uh, the goodness and, and glory and the majesty of who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please open your Bibles to Titus chapter 3. This is our final sermon in this series on this small book. And so the last few verses of chapter 3 we'll cover this morning. What a great, as David said, truth in that song. In Christ alone we stand, we're saved. Um, we do all we do in, in Him. And I think that's the greatest message. In fact, it's the only message that the world needs to hear. And what we're going to see in this last section of Titus is our role in sharing that truth with the world. And I want to just lay this out before I even get into the introduction. You have a, a role to play in that. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have something to do with telling the world those truths. And so I want to challenge this morning for you to begin thinking about that if you've never thought about that. I'll reassure you if you're doing that, but how are you being a part of, of that process? How are you um, a part of telling people that it is in Christ alone that we have peace and rest and eternal life? You know, if, if I, I, can, I can ignore small symptoms, let's put it that way. Um, I can ignore them in my own health sometimes. I can Ignore the small gas or oil stain on my driveway until it's too late. I can ignore this or that. And I don't know, some of you are out there right now saying, yeah, I can relate to that. And others are you saying, oh, boy, I'm glad I'm not married to that because that can be a frustrating thing. Well, churches are experiencing some symptoms that you may not know about, that you may not even be aware of, but those that study... No, you, you hear reports, I'm sure, every once in a while that fewer and fewer people claim to be Christians and more and more people claim to have no religious affiliation whatsoever. Well, in the ranks of the churches, there, are, there is a shortage of pastors. Um, in, in 19, let me get the dates right, 1992, so I was married in 1992, okay, 30 years ago. Pastors, the median age of a pastor is 44 years old, okay? Today, it's 54 years old, okay? So we have an aging pastorate in the United States. At one point, over a third of those pastors in 1992 were less than 40 years old. Today, it's, there's only 15% of us that are less than 55 years old. We're old, okay? Which, here's the symptom of that. Guess what's going to happen in the next 5, 10 years? Pastors are going to die. Pastors are going to retire, and there's nobody there coming in behind them. And so the challenge of this text in particular and the challenge I want to lay before you is uh, we have to have a deeper bench, not just to be a pastor. I, I, I think I've covered this in the church planning in the Titus. It's not just because you pay somebody to do something. The people are involved, but we need people involved because the day is coming when there will be fewer and fewer people willing to do some of the paid work 
and we know society is losing the people that are doing the volunteer work, and it's just a, it's, it's a recipe for a, a tough time ahead. Well, in this three verses, um, or four verses, Paul mentions some people, and it just dawned on me this week, if he were writing to us, or if he were writing about us, Whose names would he mention? Would your name be on that list of people that were vital in the work of, of the church there, and the churches there in Crete? Um, this letter, as you know, we've, we've entitled it this way, is about us doing good. It's all about electing uh, or, or uh, uh, identifying elders who love what is good and rebuking those who don't do good and we're saved so that we can do good. Uh, a verse that came to my mind this week when Peter's talking to Cornelius about Jesus. They talk about Jesus went about doing good. We're simply following in our Savior's footsteps when we do this. And here we go in Titus chapter 3. Again, f figure out if your name would be on this list or how that would play out. As, as soon as I sent, send Artemis, Artemis and Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, because I have decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for the urgent needs and to not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends your greetings. Greet those you love and us who love us in the faith, and grace be with you all. That's how Paul ends this letter. Okay, let's pray. God, thank you for these um, just personal comments by the apostle. And thank you, God, that they're a challenge to us. And uh, I just pray, God, that you would raise up um, new leaders, God, that you would encourage those serving. And, God, that we would just see your hand at work in this. So we can continue not just here, but in Trimble and in other places to um, make your name known. It's a worthy cause, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, to be honest with you, when I first saw this passage and we had scheduled it, it's like, what are we going to do with that, right? It's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the salutation, it's the ending of a, a letter that Paul wrote again to Titus on the island of Crete. And, um, but I found five things to say. So here we go. The first is that the church should be a going church. That the work of the church, I don't think was ever intended to simply be one location one time, that's the end of it. I think the church should always be looking towards how can they go to new places. We've mentioned this morning Trimble. We've mentioned this morning El Salvador. The, the influence that Grace Community Church has in Smithville should go to other places. It should spill out. It should multiply, frankly. And so just the fact that Paul is, if you can get this shuffling people around, shows you that there's still work to be done, and he's trying to put the right people in the right places to make that work go to, to help it continue. And so he says there in verse 12, as soon as I, we know who Paul is, but Paul in that day, is an, he's an apostle. He has the authority to tell Titus where to go. He has the authority to tell Tychicus and Artemis where to go. And I don't have that authority. I, there are days, frankly, I wish I did. There's lots of days I'm glad I don't. But I want you to think about this. Just do this mental exercise for a moment because I did. So point A you have is the sender. Who's, who's writing this? Paul has the authority to literally say, hey, you, you go do this. You go do that. I'm going to tell you where to go, Right? Let me ask you two questions along those lines. If I were a person like Paul who had the authority to say to you, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to go do that, okay, what would your response be? Would you say, oh, great, I don't want to do it, I don't like it, but you need me there, I'll go, right? How would you respond to that? The, the other question I want you to ask yourself is, are you even asking God that question? Okay, get me out of the picture for a second. Every believer has been gifted by God and called to be a part of the work. Somehow, if, if I could, 
and I don't have, I don't have the knowledge to do this. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not applying for this job. But I'm just telling you, God wants to say, I want to use you somewhere. And, and again, if you wouldn't respond to me, and I don't expect you to respond to me, but as much as I'm presenting the word of God to you, are you responding to God? Are you even open to the idea that God wants to put you someplace to do the work of the gospel? Okay? So that's who's sent. And again, I can't do that, but or that's the sender. Point B is the sent, and there's a couple names here, Artemis and Tychicus. So let's go through those. Artemis, we know like nothing about this guy. Not from the Bible. And we've covered this week after week, and I know it's getting redundant, at least it is to me a little bit. So much of what happens in the kingdom of God happens just by ordinary believers who don't have any kind of recognition. We don't know who they are, but it's the backbone of so much that goes on. And so if you're, you know, just wondering if anybody appreciates you, I want to say from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate you. I know. Last week was spring break for teachers. I know one teacher in particular that couldn't wait for last week. And I know from her talking to her friends and me talking to other staff members who are also married to teachers, teachers could not wait for last week. Now, let me draw it here to church. Not a pity party, but we were tired too. You're just kind of this hard push after Christmas. Your church staff needed a break last week, and we got one. It was kind of nice. We called off Wednesday night. The Awana crew and all the, all the volunteers around here were able to take a breath and get back at it, Okay. That's because there were people like Artemis, who we really don't know anything about, at least in this setting, who are doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Now, Tychicus is another idea, and we know a lot about him. He was a faithful brother, we learned, uh, in, in Ephesus, who is a servant of the Lord. Um, he went with, he, it's, it, he's like Barnabas, who is full of the Holy Spirit and used in the kingdom. And so, what I'm challenging you to do, again, is... One, if, if you're encouraged by this, be encouraged by it. But if you're challenged by it, be one of those people who just rolls up your sleeve and does what needs to be done. Now, point C is the selection. You'll notice there Paul says, I'm going to either send to you Artemis or Tychicus. I just find it refreshing that he has a choice to make, okay? That there's, there's again, the deep bench analogy. There's somebody there. In fact, there's a couple people there he could send. And that's where we're not now, not just as Grace Community Church, but I said earlier, in, in the church in general. Like, we don't have a lot of options in many places. And so I'm just trying to build up the bench a little bit with that first part. Make sure you're saying, how can I go into the kingdom work? How can I do that? What's my role in that? Point two is we need to be a growing church, or a church should be a growing church. And I do not mean by this, Although there may be a correlation, I do not mean by this we have to be bigger and bigger and bigger. What I do mean by this is we need to be more and more mature. Not just as individual Christians, but again as a church where as a whole we're all more mature spiritually. That again we have more and more people involved in in the ministry. And so he says there in the second part of verse 12, do your best to come to me. To Nicopolis, okay, that's a town, there's seven of them in the New Testament, or there's seven of them that we know about, I think they're all in the New, yeah, seven of them in the New Testament, it means the city of victory, which means there were a bunch of warriors going around, when they take a city, they call it the city of victory, so we, there's a bunch of them there, we're not sure exactly which one this is, probably the south of Greece, okay, I've seen pictures of the south of Greece, some of you have been there, I, it looks like a wonderful place, because Paul says, I have decided to winter there. Uh, I think Arizona right now, right? That's what I'm thinking. All you guys go to Arizona and the beaches and stuff like that. And there's, there's probably some truth to that, but it dawned on me that Paul and others like him, he's not, just, he's not going to see, uh, you know, the, the spring training games in, in Arizona. He, he doesn't have a timeshare in Florida. That's not what he's about. For health issues, I think, for just longevity issues, people had to travel. You couldn't spend time in the harsher areas and and, and Paul, um, getting up there at age, needs, needs that time of rest. And so under that heading of a growing church, I have A, and this will get real repetitive, but I only had four verses to work with, so get off my back. A, replacing leaders. Think about what he's doing here. He's taking Titus, who the whole book's about him. The whole letter is written to Titus. He's to establish leaders there. And now what he's doing is writing to Titus and saying, I'm going to send you either Artemis or Tychicus 
so that you can come to me. What he's done there is, what he's doing there is he's replacing his one-time leader, Titus, with another leader, either Tychicus or, or Artemis. Which means at some point, that person that's in charge moves on or, or moves out. When I read those statistics earlier, guess what? I fit right into those demographics. I am 55 years old. I, I don't know the number, but Lord willing, I'll be here another decade or so. You may decide another year's enough and get rid of me. I don't know. But I see, I'm beginning to see in my age, oh, there is an end to this someday, right? And so one thing you as a church and we as a church need to think about is what happens when the old man dies or when the old man retires or he can't do it anymore. You guys say, I can't stand listening to him for another sermon, you know, what, however that goes. But it has to be replaced. You have to think about that. You have to think about what's next. And that's one reason you have to have that deep bench, which is point B, redundant, raising up leaders. Again, I want to ask you the question, are you deliberately asking, are you deliberately open to, how does God want to use me and develop me in the work of ministry? I'm not just talking about paid staff. I'm not just talking about even just volunteering at church. I'm talking about in the kingdom. But you need to ask that question, are you thinking even, is it on, I'm trying to call you out here. Are you even thinking, how could I be more influential in the kingdom? I'm going to read you a couple parables at the end of this. And one of them shocking to me because you're going to read about a servant who is frankly just indifferent to the kingdom. They're not bad. They're not bad talking Jesus or anything. They're just not involved. And Jesus has, has, has some harsh words to say or shocking words to say. So we ought to be raising up leaders, and thirdly, and I won't bemoan this, uh, leaders need their rest. And there's those times for those. And, and God, I, I would just tell you as a pastor of a church now for 23 years, you've let me rest along the way. If not, I would not be here now. I, just trust me. I know me well enough to know that if, that if there were more demands on me and my family than I could take, I wouldn't have lasted this long. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Pray for other pastors and other churches. There are some that are just in the grindstone right now. I mean, it, it, the demands on them, they don't have the support, they don't have the help. Pray for, if you, if you pass, this is what got me started at Trimble. If you, if you pass a church someplace, say a prayer for that church, for the leaders there, the people there, because there's some tough situations out there. All right, so we've got a going church, hopefully a growing church, and I don't mean numbers, just Thirdly, a generous church. If you look at verse 13, he says, Do everything you can to help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos. And we know these people before. Apollos, remember, was the one um, that Priscilla and Aquila came alongside. He knew, he knew certain things, and they kind of lifted him up. And, but it says to help them on their way and to see that they have everything that they need. And, and I will break this down this way. A is... He was asking them to literally furnish money. They needed resources. Much of the New Testament is written as collections were made. Like we're talking about the North American mission offering or things that we, when we collect offerings here. It takes money. It takes, I can't say it any other way. It takes money to do things. And so what he's literally asking the church and Titus and, Titus and the churches to do is provide for them money so that they can continue on the ministry, that they can continue on everything. A couple thoughts here, and one is I heard on the radio this week, um, I, I, it, it was one of the Christian um, financial, I can't even remember if it was Larry Burkett or who it was, but it was Randy Alcorn, who has written books on heaven and what's really important. And he was talking about storing up your treasures in heaven. And he had an exercise, I wish I had thought about this when my boys were younger, but he would take his children at some point in their childhood to the junkyard. And see those rotting, rusty cars and RVs and trucks and just refrigerators and all that. And Alcorn would tell his kids, he goes, you realize people work their whole life for some of these things? Like that car was their dream car. Do you realize divorces happened over some of these things? And he told his kids, don't waste your effort. Don't waste your time thinking about those things. Think about heavenly things. Think about eternal things. That's the souls that need Jesus. That's the work of the kingdom. And Jesus would talk about where your treasure is, your heart is. And so just think about that. What are you working for? Where's your heart? 
Literally, they need money. And so here's, I'm going to do this. We've never done this before, but just think with me for a second of a ladder, okay? There are different levels that people give. And we don't talk a lot about giving around here. You guys are generous, and we don't have to, and it's, it's a good thing. But think about a ladder. And there are some people that are, at, like, at the bottom of the ladder, and they, they give when they think about it, and it's just kind of, you know, just something they do every once in a while. If you move up, and, and one, there's several ways to look at this. One of them has words that, that those people are just starting out giving. Then there's people who are steady givers. That's the next S word in the ladder. And they, they give regularly. They might, it might not be a set amount, but they, if they've got a $5 bill or whatever in their pocket, and they'll write that check every week or however it goes. The next level they have is, so we've got starting and steady and, steady and scriptural, which you set aside a part of your income every week, and you, and you give it to the Lord on a regular basis. We call it tithing. 10% is a good rule on that. And so you've moved from just somebody that gives occasionally to gives regularly, who gives some thought to it, and says, I'm going to set aside part of my resources. In fact, what God calls me to do is set apart that part so that the work can go on. Then it moves to a sacrificial giver who gives beyond that percentage. And then this one illustration talks about the supernatural giver who decided this is what I need in life and everything else goes to the kingdom. And I'm not trying to drum up our offerings here. I'm saying don't buy a bunch of rusty cars, you know. Think about your giving. And the, the idea of that, that ladder is how can you go from level one to level whatever, what the next step is in that. And I would challenge you with that. Because point B I have is to further the mission. He's not just asking Zenus, the lawyer, to come for the fun of it. This is about kingdom work. This is what they're doing. And I think of the Roman passage where Paul writes, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call if no one believes in, if they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? That's what Paul is doing here. He's sending people, and he's so, so the, further, the furtherance of the kingdom. That's what he's doing. I want to encourage you to be a part of that. Fourthly, so we have a going church, a growing church, a generous church, and a good church. Okay, I like our church. I hope you like our church. It's the best church in Smithville, in my humble opinion, if I do say so myself. It's, it's, uh, anyway, I, I, could, I could go on and on about that. I really do like being your pastor. I hope you like this church. I think you do. It's a good church. I don't mean it's a good church in that way. I mean what Paul means when he says, go about doing good. Doing good is what honors God and what helps other people. And so that's the theme of this book. And he says right off their bat there in verse 14, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good. So point A I have, learning personally. It doesn't necessarily come natural to go about doing good. It's a supernatural work, and it's something we grow in. And, and the, the, again, the couple words that popped out at me are people must learn to devote themselves. It's a, it's a process. Are you learning like that? Are you learning? How can God use me in the kingdom? I, I'm a firm believer, and I've tried to practice this, that just look for needs and try and meet them. The simplest things, from emptying trash at an event to whatever, whatever, whatever. Just try to make other people's lives easier and point them to Jesus. That's, Jesus is the greatest example of this, who did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life for others. And so I want to challenge you in that area too. Are you learning to devote yourselves to doing what is good? Secondly, loving practically in order to provide for urgent needs. That's, where, that's the service thing. What do people need? How can you help them in that process? For some, it's just an encouraging word. For others, it's a gift. For others, it's this or it's that. But we're placed here to do good. And, and, and again, there's other passages that talk about this, especially those in the, believer, in the church of Christ and those who don't work, don't eat. Oh, I got all that stuff. But again, like I said last week, if your yeah buts are bigger than your so that's, then get your mind around that for a second. So love practically, and thirdly, live productively, and not live unproductive lives. 
Forget the junkyard for a second. Think about the graveyard for a second. When it comes to the kingdom of God, are you, will you have lived what would be known as a productive life? One commentator, and I'm going to read you, I'm going to have you turn to the book of Luke here in a second. One commentator made this point about, and I'm paraphrasing, how sad it is if a human being does not know why they were born. He says, even more sad is a human, is a Christian who doesn't know that why they were born again. One of the headings, one of the things we talked about in chapter, the beginning of this chapter was you're saved in order to do good. Your Savior went about doing good. Don't live unproductive lives. Now turn with me to Luke chapter 17. I've been struck by two um, parables of Jesus this week and last week, in fact, and I can't get them out of my mind. And God knew that there was only four verses on our text today, so he said, you got some time to go to a couple other passages. I, really, I say that halfway jokingly. I do believe God did that because I could not figure out why these things were pressing in on me the way they were, and then it dawned on me. Jesus tells us a few parables about what it means for people to live unproductive lives. And so here you go. Look at verse, what did I tell you, chapter 17, look at verse 7. In, in this section, Jesus had just talked about um, don't make other people stumble. Uh, he, talked to, he talked about if, if somebody sins against you, forgive them. Um, he talks about if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, it says in verse 6, you can, you can say uproot this mulberry tree and it will obey you. And if we're not careful, we'll think, well, we can just go around and, and be pretty sure of ourselves. And then he tells this, and, and, and think about why he said this. He goes, listen, you can do incredible things for God. With just a little obedience and a little faith, you can do something incredible for God. And then he wants to remind them, you're simply doing what you were created to do. Don't become arrogant in that. And so look at verse 7. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Okay, hard work. Both of those are hard work. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, to stop for a second, so picture this. You're a servant. You've been plowing all day. You've been chasing sheep all day. Your, your, your daytime work is done, but you work for the master, and so you get home, right? Will he say, come along now and sit down and eat? Wouldn't you love to serve a master like that? Well, won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? Can you just picture yourself in that stage here? I've been out there chasing your sheep all day and plowing your fields all day. And I get home, and now you want me to cook you dinner and wait on you while you eat. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told? Verse 10, so you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, catch this, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. What he's saying is the work is never done, Christian. If you're involved in ministry, if you're involved in living a productive life as we've defined it, you're only doing what you were created to do. And trust me, there's other passages where Jesus takes off his robe and comes and worships you. And you will get crowns and rewards for this. But don't think we're special just because we're doing what we were created to do. God has done great things here. But the work's not done. Right? We may be home and want to kick up. My, my mother-in-law has a teacher for, two teachers for daughters and says, when can you retire? Teachers think about that all the time. They got the charts and everything. I know in three years I can do this, right? And then I've told this story before. Then she looks at me and says, George, when can you retire? And I say, I hope I die doing this stuff. See, we don't retire from the ministry. We don't retire from the calling. And so I'm trying to say, and, and as gracefully and graciously as I can, you're simply doing what you're told to do. God doesn't owe us anything. God is never our debtor. We're simply doing what he's worthy of. 
And it was pointed out in that, that last verse there, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. So many of us think, I'm unworthy because of the sin in my life. Think of this. You're also unworthy because of the service of your life. Can I just cut through the self-affirmation junk? We're unworthy. But Christ came and died for us. We didn't deserve an ounce of that. We're not special and he needs me to preach this morning. He needs you to empty. He doesn't need any of that stuff. Because we're going to learn, I think, next week, if we shut up, the rocks will cry out. But we have the privilege. I have another, a pastor friend that says it's not a, a have to, it's a get to. We get to be a part of the most important thing happening on the planet today, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Flip over, if you would, now to Matthew 22, or sorry, Luke 22, and we'll end. These are only a few verses. Actually, I lied to you. Go back to Luke 19. Luke 19, thank you. Luke 19, Jesus has just talked to Zacchaeus, and then he tells another parable about ten minas. And you can read this whole thing. He gives one servant one bit of money. He gives, he gives all the servants the same amount of money as the, as the, the idea. And one um, puts it to work and, and gains ten times as much. And the master says, well done, I'll put you in charge of ten cities in my kingdom. And there's a whole lot of history behind this. I might get into it someday. Uh, a second servant has five. And I mean, does fivefold, and, and so he gets five cities. And then look at the last servant. Um, look at verse 20. Another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it and laid it away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and uh, reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words. You wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I would, could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten. Sir, they said, he already has ten. And he replied, I tell you that everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And there's a whole bunch around this. But this is where the, the indifferent word came in, in my mind. There are too many believers, saved believers of Jesus Christ. They're going to heaven when they die. But frankly, they don't give two thoughts about what they're doing to advance the kingdom. They're building their own kingdom. They got their own stuff going on. They don't give a, they don't give a rip about that. They're safe. They're happy. Their church is fine or whatever. But they don't think for an instant that when Jesus comes back, he's going to say, how did you take what you gave? They're just indifferent to all that. And what's he call them? He says, you're wicked. And I believe in the context, they're saved in this point. But there's just, they don't get honored for that. They're simply unworthy servants called, now how's this for a pump you up kind of servant, right? I've called you unworthy and wicked. I'm telling you there's the greatest rewards in these, but not in this lifetime. That's what I'm trying to get at. Finally and quickly, a grace church. Look at verse 15. Everyone with me sends greetings and greet those who love us in the faith. So A is lovingly greet. There's a couple of Greek words for love. One's agape. You know about that. We share that a lot. This is that word phileo, which means a friendly love, a, a brotherly love. It, uh, agape is more of a decision. Phileo is more like feeling. I want to tell you all, and I hope you feel it in this room too, I love you both ways. Okay? We're to love our enemies, by the way, with the agape kind of love. We, just, we, have, to, we have to serve them and love them and pray for them. But we love one another with, a, with a, an emotional, friendly kind of way. I hope some of your best friends are right here. Okay? The world sees that, by the way. And so we need to lovingly be the body of Christ, greet one another, and point B, live by grace. Grace be with you all. He ends this letter. 
Grace is not just the name of a church or two, now in tremble. Grace is, I think, the principle by which we live. We're saved by it. We're sent by it. We're, we fight sin by it. All those things. Here's how I would challenge you at the end of this. Here's my application question. A, are you going? Are you willing to go where God calls you to go? Okay. B, or secondly, are you growing? Are you learning to devote yourself to doing what is good? Thirdly, are you generous? I want you to evaluate your giving this morning and how that goes. Fourthly, are you doing good? Are you looking for how you can serve other people? And finally, are you living by grace? That starts with trusting Christ for your salvation. And then it moves on from serving him by grace too. It's how Paul started this letter. It's how Paul ended this letter. It's how I'm going to end this message. Let's pray. God, thank you for your letter um, from Paul to Titus. Thank you for even the instructions we find in the last and the closing verses. Um, God, again, on my heart, I think it's evident this morning is that we not be unworthy servants, that we simply do what we're created to do. And God, that we are um, not indifferent to the work of the kingdom, that we are investing the gifts and the resources and the energy you've placed on our lives um, to further the knowledge of Christ, to make his ma name known in Smithville and in Trimble and El Salvador and any place that we go as we work and as we play and as we go to school. So we've got all these points here. I, just, I pray that you would have touched our hearts and called us to your son, Jesus Christ, not just for salvation, but the way we live our lives. Maybe he glorified in all of this. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing.
God, thank you for meeting us here today in your word, by your spirit, God, and in your people. And may we go about now doing good for your name's sake. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you all. I encourage you again, work day at Tremble at 1 if you can help, or stay for 11 and listen to Joel preach if you can. Have a great day. I lift my eyes up, my help come from the Lord. I lift my eyes up, my help come from the Lord. I lift my eyes. No